Welcome to the CSE Research Podcast, a series of conversations about projects taking place at the Center for the Study of African Economies, University of Oxford. Uh, my name is Stefan Durkon. I'm the director here of the CSE and a professor of economic policy at the Department of Economics and the Blavatnik School of Government. Last week, the Economic and Social Research Council of the UK hosted their Celebrating Impact 2023 prize ceremony. And I'm delighted to be joined today by the winner of the award for Outstanding Public Policy Impact, Kate Orkin. Kate is a member of the CSE. She's an Associate Professor in Economics and Public Policy at the Blavatnik School of Government and lead of the Mind and Behaviour Research Group at the University of Oxford. Kate, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's uh, it's a uh, it's great to be able to talk about research that seems to have actually had impact, rather than uh, aspirational research that hopes maybe to have some impact. So, it's great also for us to do this because you know, as the center, it's something we try to um, to achieve to actually just do research, not just as relevant for academic purposes, which is a virtuous. A purpose in itself, but also to try to get further and see whether we can actually make a difference. So I would be delighted to hear a little bit more from you about, you know, what was what was the problem that your contribution tried to resolve here? Tell us a little bit more about what was going on and what you were trying to solve. So I'll take you back to the very early days of the COVID pandemic. Um, so this, this impact happened in South Africa. Um, but the situation was very similar all across the developing world. So in, in April 2020, there were about one in five South Africans going to bed hungry. And in many countries, you know, they'd locked down very hard. Uh, work is very casual. Um, and so millions of workers were laid off. And if there was any government support, it has tended to be through food parcel distribution. And so in South Africa, like in many places, the existing system of getting aid out was just completely overwhelmed. There were issues with logistical management. There was theft. And so you just saw these nightly images on the news of these long queues for food. And they were all, you know, running out. And that that really dire situation was happening across the developing world. We know these problems are quite predictable. So there's actually been um, a longstanding evidence base in development economics over the last 20 years that's tried to change what we, what economists now think of as quite an ideological, non-evidence-based approach to aid, which is that it has to go out as food. Um, and policymakers worry a lot that if you just give recipients cash, they'll spend it frivolously. Um, and so they either give as food or if welfare is given as cash, so like to job seekers, it often has these quite strict conditions attached, like um, you have to ha you have to be searching for a job. And so um, you know, in this policy situation, uh, the existing research base that we had is, which is, you know, actually is very strong, is quite a radical new form of welfare. It's the idea that you can just give cash directly to poor households, uh, including during emergencies. And during uh, or, or pre-COVID, you and I, as well as, uh, you know, another a big team of other researchers, um, Rob Garlick, Maureen Mahmood, Richard Sedelmeyer, Johannes Haushofer, We'd run this big randomized trial in Kenya with Give Directly, this NGO that has really pioneered this approach, to test what happens when you just give cash directly to poor households. And like a lot of other studies, we find that recipient households really use the money well, quote unquote. You know, they're spending it on food that improves children's nutrition and development. They're also using cash to buy assets for businesses or to search for work. Um, they, they're often working, in fact, more rather than less, and they're certainly not wasting the money. They're you know, really investing it in things that can help them to improve their economic position in the future. And so what this research was trying to do was apply that evidence base, which we had pre-COVID, to the you know, crisis of aid distribution that was happening during the COVID pandemic and say, look, actually, we know a shift that needs to happen. Um, it's a really big shift, but we, we need to stop trying to think we can get food parcels out and that that's going to solve this emergency. We need to do something that, that policymakers may not approve of, but you know, if we can give aid as cash, we'll be able to get it out much faster and to many more people. 
right so so that's and that's that's really interesting because the you know if we if we think about it you know the the evidence base and as you also re- allude to around you know that cash can be really effective it's been there now for a while and it's it's an interesting thing that every time again when you try to to do some of these things um and you tell policymakers well we have the evidence you can just do cash i know from experience as well a lot of people will have these prejudices and and it's not just you know governments it's middle classes it's all kind of people have these prejudices of of how to actually uh you know that that actually giving cash will have these um non beneficial impacts so so it's one thing to supply the evidence but you know it clearly needs other work as well so how did you go about convincing them and i think that's the more almost the more important part because we can keep on writing these papers we can write a little blog we can say this we have the evidence there but we've seen so many countries that it's not been picked up so tell us a little bit more how the impact came about and 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 how did you go about this so i think the the most important thing is that this could happen because there was this huge evidence. Researchers tend to get excited about their new study and their working paper. It's not even published yet. And then they want to go and say to the government, oh, you should do this new thing at the frontier um, that that I've come up with. And I think the key thing here was that we we were able to say, you know, there's there's been systematic reviews. There are now 160 studies all around the world in many different contexts that have similar findings. You know, we've done it recently in a context like Kenya, which is very similar to this country, but actually the evidence base was big. I think for me, that was that was important. In fact, possibly governments shouldn't be scaling you know, one study. They should be scaling things where we have meta-analyses, where we know that the evidence base is deep and it's, it's uncontroversial what to do. Um, so I think that was the the first thing. It was really important when talking to government that we weren't just shopping our solution. We were doing evidence reviews across the broad range of the evidence, um, across multiple contexts, including contexts that were similar to South Africa, uh, to draw the conclusion. So I think the, that was the first thing was, you know, the, the evidence base has actually got to be quite deep. The second thing was, you know, changing format from the what a research paper was into what was actually going to be useful in the policy process. So the way that the impact happened, we work collaboratively with the presidency and the social security agency and the department for social development in South Africa. And there were a group of civil servants who, you know, had, knew of this evidence base and they formed a working group on poverty that wanted to, uh, you know, see whether we the existing grant system in the country could be used to uh, you know put in place these solutions, but the the really important thing was um, workshopping the policy questions that they needed answers to, thinking about the formats that they needed the answers in. So it wasn't a research paper, it wasn't a policy brief. It was you know we have these um, we're going to have to go through kind of uh, cabinet resolutions, so we need a a sort of short um, summary of of what's being proposed. And then we need the underpinning research work written in a really kind of uh, clear, accessible format. And I think learning to do that writing was completely different from how you would write a research paper. You know, it's really focusing on what the evidence is across the range of papers rather than just one paper. So, you know, you're writing statements like, uh, you know, there are 20 studies in this field and six of them find this and, you know, 14 of them find that. So, you know, our best guess is that this is the uh, this is, you know, what one should learn from that evidence. And so I think that's really something economists don't do a lot in health. We do a lot of meta studies. Um, we've actually worked a bit with the mind and behavior group on doing some some meta analysis studies. I think that was actually the most important skill um, that I was able to bring to this was sort of looking across the evidence. So I think I think that was the the second thing, and then the third thing, which is something the CSA has been you know really um, worked at very hard, is having these deep, long collaborations with economists in developing countries. Um, so that you here we were working with uh, the university in Cape Town, that was actually where I did my undergrad. Um, so working with a, a team 
uh, led by Ingrid Woolard, uh, Murray Labrant. And then we also had uh, Maya Goldman, Tutu Kohlela, uh, Jessica Nicklin, Brindy Kreft. So it's a really deep team of uh, both senior and um, more junior researchers who had huge government reputation. Uh, so they'd done consultation for the Treasury and the presidency before Murray was on the uh, you know big panel that looked at social welfare even pre-pandemic. And so you know it, it was working with that team that we were able to achieve policy impact because we had local credibility. So I think those kind of three ingredients really were what brought together having the impact. But it's very different from what the current model is, particularly in the RCT world of you do one trial and then you write a policy brief and then government's going to do the policy. This wasn't what it looked like at all. And I think that was a really important learning for us. So can you push you a little bit on that in terms of the way these debates would have gone and the way people were thinking about what is that evidence base, you know? Um, you know, I don't know if any of the studies you could review referred specifically to South Africa, but often you get this experience that, yeah, maybe that may have worked in, I don't know, in, in Ethiopia or in India, but it won't work here. You know, we are different. You, there is no external validity to this. Um, or, you know, surely the cost involved here would be so much higher. What are these numbers involved? So so was there any kind of, you know, attempts to do some modeling work, do some some adjustment work? You know, how, how, how was that handled? Was that something the Treasury people were doing or was other people doing? Tell me a bit more about that. And then how do you convince bureaucrats? How do you convince civil servants? I've been one, you know, it's not easy to convince to convince them. So so how do you think? Tell us a little bit more how that all went. So, I mean, I, I think one of the, in, so, you know, first focusing on the, inter, uh, you know, does the international evidence apply or not? I mean, in, in this particular instance, actually, the government was hugely eager to get that comparative evidence base because South Africa had this long history of doing cash grants for pensions. Um, there's a big child support grant that was put in place that's been enormously successful. Um, so, you know, we didn't know about running cash grants. Um, and that that program is is actually kind of world leading in terms of the number of beneficiaries who it man you know, manages to reach successfully. It's very well targeted. It's extremely pro poor. Uh, there's not a lot of leakage in the program. It's you know works on biometrics. So there there was that success case. And I think you know had we been starting with the social welfare system from scratch, that probably would have would have been difficult. But they were incredibly eager to learn from other countries. So one of the most focused on um, you know, pieces in the policy brief, we had sat during the early days of the pandemic, we actually got a Venezuelan student who could read on what the Latin American countries were doing, you know, when it was still in Spanish and Portuguese, rather than, um, you know, we, we couldn't even get it in English. But we had this comparative table of what are the different countries doing, uh, the World Bank, so Ugo Gentilini, and uh, that sort of social protection group, they were talking a lot about the evolving response to the crisis. And policymakers really wanted that because I think one of the things they were worried about was, um, you know, are, are, the, are our investors going to think we're being completely profligate, just giving out money to our populations? And the fact that there was this broad movement towards increasing social protection during the pandemic in other countries was really important to reassure them that, you know, perhaps there wouldn't be that response in this case. So I think people were really eager um, to get the international experience. Actually, one of the things Murray and, and um, Ingrid and team had worked on, uh, you know, even in, in previous uh, iterations of work that they'd done, was a deep mission kind of talking to the people who did Bolsa Familia in Brazil and learning a bit more about how they did the targeting. Because the approach that South Africa's ended up using is the most similar to Brazil compared to, to other countries. So I think there was a real eagerness to learn from other countries um, and, you know, yeah, so not a sense that this wasn't relevant and we have to have the evidence for our context. You know, policymakers are quite used to making the decisions based on, um, you know, not perfect information. I think sometimes we, in especially in the RCT world, we think, oh, we have to have done the RCT of this trial in this context at this time. And they were less worried about that. You sometimes having to make jumps um, you know, and you don't have the perfect evidence. The other thing that uh, you asked about cost, that was super important. And, you know, we we did some cost calculations in our initial uh, Kenya trial, but I didn't know anything about studying costs, which is a great shame, I think. 
Um, and one of the, you know, what the UCT team brought, you know, they're not primarily RCT researchers. They weren't studying cash transfers, but they they um, had already built this model of the South African economy that one could use to study uh, the poverty incidence of social transfers and, you know, how, uh, if, if you also wanted to put in place tax increases, how that would affect, um, you know, uh, levels of poverty. And so that wasn't a modeling technique I was familiar with as someone who primarily does field experiments. But that was the core of the work was being able to say, you know, this is how many poor people there are, you know, people below the poverty line. If you give this amount of, of uh, money, this is how it's going to change, you know, what people's consumption levels are, whether they're living in poverty. And then if you do different versions of the grant, this is how many people are going to be uh, eligible and what the poverty impact is going to be. And so that model was the core of the work that we did. And it was a real learning to me as an RCT researcher. You know, the benefits is are only the first step. And then you have to be able to say to the government, who is this going to reach and how much is it going to cost? And those are not tools we've even, you know, we we just cost what's in the RCT, but that's it's not even the right question. So I think that really blew open for me what the discipline needs to be doing if you're really going to get national governments to scale. And I think it is collaborating much more with researchers in the sort of uh, fiscal and public space to say, you know, how is this policy going to play out at an at a national scale? So, so yeah, that that that's that's really interesting. And okay, so clearly, you know, it's one thing for a government to take up a policy and to do it. Um, let me uh, gently suggest you wouldn't get an impact price if there is no evidence that actually it had impact, <laughs> and that actually there is some evidence for South Africa. Of, of the impact it had. You know, that there's there's one thing that um, I don't think I've ever told you really is that, uh, you know, I was a peer reviewer actually of a review on, on the impact on poverty uh, across the world from the COVID uh, pandemic uh, run by the World Bank. And uh, it was really interesting because they just crunched the numbers from all over the world, whatever they can come in. And, um, and they kept on being worried about because South Africa was an outlier. Uh, and I said, there must be something wrong with the numbers here and so on. And actually, only in that process, we could say, and maybe there's one or two other countries that actually really had managed to to have a substantial poverty impact during the pandemic in ways that you know, they were quite surprised by. And so so they ended up digging deeper. And and it is the case that uh, I've seen from the World Bank clearly um, from their, their comparative evidence that South Africa ended up ended up being judged as one of the countries that better handled the poverty impacts than than many, if not most, countries across the world. Now, I presume you will have, you know, other evidence. I'm sure the government has been trying to collect it. Tell us a little bit more. You know, what is the imp impact on beneficiaries and what kind of things have have, have we learned since? So the, the basic policy shift, you know, so we had the situation where they were giving, um, I think they were giving out about 1.2 million food parcels a week, but there were about 10 million people who were below the bread line. So below the food poverty line, they didn't have enough income that they could actually get enough to eat. Um, so, you know, the, the need was about a 10th of what was, you know, was actually necessary, it was going to be necessary to avoid widespread hunger. And what the government did in that situation, um, instead of keep sticking with the food parcels, so the food parcels were actually a constitutionally set up approach to social welfare. So, um, you know, like many developing countries, they didn't have a basic grant if you were an adult, you were able bodied, so you didn't have a disability, but you were unemployed. And so the only thing that was there was these food parcels if you were really in very dire need and you could go to your municipality and apply for them. So the shift that, uh, you know, with the UCT researchers um, and, um, and our team at Oxford, the shift that we achieved was instead of delivering aid through this food parcel system, the government did two things. They first increased the amount that was paid to people who are already getting a cash grant. So pensioners, um, women largely who were receiving child grants on behalf of their children and people who had a disability payment. So they temporarily increased the amount of the cash grants. We know already from the evidence that people share that money with their families. So the idea was, you know, you uh, already through the grant system, just by increasing the amount that flows out, you'll be able to reach more people. 
And then the second thing, which was the really you know remarkable policy shift, was to do this new monthly cash grant um, for 10 million able-bodied unemployed people. They had previously not had any welfare payments, but the government put in place an entire new grant <laughs> in a six-week period. And the technology was amazing. People mainly signed up for it for WhatsApp, but they via WhatsApp, but they could also sign up online. Um, and so they, uh, you signed up for the grant, then you were checked, you know, this was the Brazilian approach, they checked against a set of data that, you know, a few things that they could check in admin data that you weren't very wealthy. Um, you know, you didn't have a, a vehicle, you weren't getting unemployment insurance, you weren't on the government payroll, for example. Um, and then later we actually built in that they looked at people's banking data to see their income. And then that that new technology meant that they were able to get eventually about 10 million people onto a new monthly cash grant. Um, and so all in all, that meant that we went to reaching from you know 1.2 million people who were getting the food parcels to 28 million people who were getting some sort of payment from the cash grant. Um, so that was a, a huge shift in social welfare spending. In total, governments now sent about seven billion pounds. Um, so that's about three percent of annual GDP. It's about the same scale as the as the UK furlough scheme uh, through that kind of increase in in um, cash grants. So that's and that the research has shown that that's really been targeted very well at the country's poorest households. Um, so the the sort of set of testing means testing that they did has actually managed to have a, a really sort of poverty targeted grant um and so now they they aren't they're no longer doing the increased child and pe child grants and pension payments but that um grant for the unemployed has stayed in place and so we've we've modeled that uh with the uct team and we estimate that that's currently keeping about two million people out of severe poverty every month so it's it's been a really big new kind of policy shift it's the first unemployed first grant for the unemployed in africa um, so it's it's been a really big extension of the social welfare system, uh, and it's you know really having quite remarkable uh, effects on poverty. Maybe kids. As a final question, you know, we're all researchers. We all try to have impact at times. Um, what have you learned about trying to get impact from research from this experience? I think the the most important thing in this was was empathy. It was about stepping out of your academic world and trying to put yourself in the shoes of the civil servants who were trying to solve the problem. Um, and so we worked really closely with this group. They were just incredibly committed, you know, to deliver that kind of impact. They were just working round the clock for years. Um, and so I think to to really say if I was sitting facing this problem what are the technical inputs that I would need? And you you have to take yourself as a researcher out of the process. It's not about whether it's your particular thing that's got your name on it. Um, you know, it's not about whether it's your particular solution. It's about what, uh, you know, what's actually going to be the best in this situation. And I think drawing on the really broad range of evidence, looking at what, you know, other people in other countries have done, um, and then really thinking about what are the, the civil servants worried about? Why are they worried about that? You know, what are the, the barriers to them, uh, you know, taking this, this policy to scale? And so I think that's thinking partly about the technical challenges. And, you know, they were really deep in the, the weeds of the numbers and the model. Um, but, you know, trying to uh, make the model so that it answered questions that they had. But then also thinking about the politics, like how are you going to get this grant through? And so I think this for us, this narrative of, you know, this there's this huge worry that the cash grant builds dependency. Um, and that's a, you know, that that has been there in welfare states for hundreds of years. But actually to have this evidence base, we don't talk about it emotionally, but it's to say, you know, giving people cash builds resilience, it builds autonomy, it builds people's ability to make decisions. And, you know, they are the owners of their economic lives and giving them this, uh, you know, you're giving them the most flexible tool that you can. And that narrative of empowerment was hugely politically important. And so once we realized, you know, wasn't a lot of the evidence is saying just, 
your food calorie consumption improves. But the thing that actually gripped people was people can look for work, they can buy assets, and that there weren't reviews on that so much. And we really focused on that evidence base. And I think that was actually what swung it. And that's also been what's kept the grant in place, you know, as part of the economic recovery is, is saying, you know, this is a tool to help, you know, where the state is struggling to get that sort of economic growth going, you're actually putting this in the hands of the citizens. And those are very effective economic agents. So I think that change in narrative was actually the most the most important thing. And that came from trying to understand the political reality that people were facing. Um, yeah, so I think empathy, empathy with your policymakers is my uh, my catchphrase. Very good. Well, um, Kate Tolkien, thank you very much for talking to us. And also, again, congratulations for winning the award of Outstanding Public Policy Impact of the Economic and Social Research Council of the UK. Thank you very much for talking to us.